Happy belated 4th of July, everybody. Mm. We're excited to bring you this special edition of the Music History Project. Welcome to the Music History Project. We're your hosts. I'm Elizabeth Dale. And Dan Del Fiorentino. And Mike Mullins. All of our content comes from the Oral History Program, which is sponsored by NAM, the National Association of Music Merchants. And that is a program that is over 3,000 interviews and constantly growing. If you want to check out any of our content or any of the other interviews that aren't featured, please check out our website at www.nam.org slash library. So we always struggle with our introduction, whether or not I should give a teaser as to what the content was. And we thought the 4th of July greeting was good enough. It was teaser enough. I know. I mean, they probably saw the title, so they already know what this podcast is about. Well, that just really deflates (laughs) me, Mike. Jeez. I'll just leave. You guys can do this without me then. Um, Today, in celebration of America's birthday, which we're a day late. Sorry, The celebration continues, though. Always. Every day in my house. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to be talking about the life of John Philip Sousa. Yes, the March King, who, as uh, one person once told me, you could not celebrate the 4th of July without having the Stars and Stripes forever playing. And I kind of agree with that. So it is fitting to pause and um, reflect on his contributions to music. And we're going to do so this afternoon with uh, a couple of people that we interviewed over the years for the NAM Oral History Program who knew him or who had uh, been inspired by him, researched him, and uh, came to understand his contributions. So I think it's going to be a very interesting insight into the guy's name we know, uh, but maybe not know a whole lot about. So just a little background about John Philip Sousa. He was born November 6th, 1854, and he died in March on March 6th, 1932. Um, he was an American composer and conductor um, during the Romantic era, which sounds... A, romantic? Like a, like a really long time ago. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, some of his more famous marches um, are the Stars and Stripes Forever, which I feel like we all hear every 4th of July. Mm-hmm. Uh, Semper Fidelis. Uh, let's see what else. Liberty Bell, The Thunderer, and The Was- Washington Post. And unfortunately, this is one of the few interviews that Dan could not capture. <laughs> I'm sure he tried somehow. I, I would have loved. His magical abilities. <laughs> so that was John Philip Sousa that just called. <laughs> <laughs> to say he's a little uh, preoccupied <laughs> underneath a pile of dirt. <laughs> um, no, but uh, since Dan didn't have the opportunity to... <laughs> actually interview John Philip Sousa, he did the second best thing. He found all these experts uh, that have devoted devoted a lot of their life's work to learning about him, uh, either because they were inspired by him or they wanted to become Sousa experts or different aspects. So we're going to hear from a few of them today. Um, And then in this first section here, we're going to be hearing from two guys, James... Said. Thank you. I never know if it's Said or... I don't know how else I'd say it, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so James Said and Paul Byerly. That's right. And um, some of his friends got to call him Jimmy. And I have to tell you, one of the most inspiring folks I ever interviewed as far as uh, giving me a passion for this uh, music products industry was Jimmy Said. Uh, He owned Sade's Music in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and was the spitting image of John Philip Sousa. He admired him greatly. He looked like him. And as a result, he was hired often uh, to imitate him. He was um, on the Johnny Carson show, at least on one occasion. He also played John Philip Sousa at the the grand opening when... uh, the CG Con Company returned to Elkhart, Indiana in the 1980s. Jimmy Sade was there to play John Philip Sousa. Um, and as we'll hear a little bit later on in the in the podcast, uh, John Philip Sousa was a really good friend of Colonel Kahn, the founder of the CG Con Band Instrument Company in Elkhart. That's part of the story of the Sousa phone uh, coming from that. But Jimmy Sade really embraced that history and he loved Sousa, talked about him 
as if he was his best friend, as you're going to be about to hear. Jimmy Sade was a really interesting guy. He um, he was born in 1915, passed away in 2004. We got to interview him in 2002 at a time where he was still working in the store. The store, by the way, is still there in uh, uh, Oklahoma, and his son Bob is running it. And like I say, I just I wanted to just take a few minutes to to uh, talk about Jimmy because he was a great inspiration to me. As I think you will soon find out, he was also a very endearing speaker. So here's a few words about the Stars and Stripes Forever from Jimmy Sade. The history of of the Stars and Stripes Forever. There's a good story there that what how it was how it happened. I don't know whether you'd be interested in that, but yeah, it's please. This comes out of John Philip Sousa's uh, uh, autobiography. That's how we really know the story. He was in Europe on a vacation, he and his wife, and uh, his manager died. He got a telegram. His manager died in the state, so he had to come back. And he was on a ship, and we're talking now about the early part of the uh, 20th century. Uh, I've forgotten the actual date, but so he, he back coming back and on the boat. One day he was just walking up and down the decks, you know, and he heard what he. This is his words. He heard a band playing in his brain, and the, and the band kept playing this same tune over and over again. And he just couldn't get it out of his head over and over again. Well, anyway, by the time he got to shore, he had not changed any of it. He took it just as it was in his head. And let me stop there and tell you that Sousa said time and again that his composing came from a higher power. And he used that term many times. So when he got home on Christmas Day. He sat down and what his brain band had played for him, he put in uh, uh, in ink. And it's never, one note has never been changed since. Hmm. That was the Stars and Stripes Forever. And at the time, he put this in there. He said, he said while that was going on, he couldn't help but think of patriotism, but he didn't have a name yet. He didn't have a name until he got home and sat down to put it together, and it was just naturally, he said, it had to be stars. Uh, in fact, he did say stars and stripes forever. A little bit later on, he put the the in front. So the actual name is the stars, stars and stripes forever. So that's the story, and it comes out of his autobiography. Wow. So you can, I use that on all of my concerts. I'd always tell the story. Okay, so was I right or was I right? The guy is endearing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great story to tell, and uh, that segment is a perfect introduction to our podcast because The Stars and Stripes is a song that we've all heard. Definitely. I mean, I think every American has heard that song, and I would imagine some of our international listeners, ooh, let's see if I can spit that out, have heard it as well. It's pretty iconic. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure it's the official march of the United States. I think the the U.S. government made that a, a thing. Very good. <laughs> Come on. I don't know what you, <laughs> what that action's right. called. Decreed? I don't that's know. Something that's like the, that. That's right. We needed a, a official march, according to a lot of the band directors that were... Um, NAM members, and this is actually NAM related because in 1985, several of the NAM members got together and went to Washington, D.C., along with the president of the NAM board at the time, Ziggy Coyle. Jimmy Sade was there, and Ronald Reagan signed into law the very first national march, which remains the same one, Stars and Stripes Forever. Very good, Mike. I'm very impressed. Look at that compliment. Oh, I'm jealous. I Keep work them coming. You'll, you'll get another one. <laughs> I got to work hard now. So the next guy we're going to talk about is the guy who really documented all the history of John Philip Sousa. He's definitely the guy who knew Sousa's career inside and out, wrote, I think, eight different books, 
one of which is like the Bible. It's unbelievable. He's got a day by day what John Philip Sousa did, every concert he played, who was in the band every time they got together. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, his name is Paul Byerly. He was um, born in 1926 and uh, passed away in um, uh, 2016. We got to interview him in 2007. And one of the things that was really amazing to me, okay, coming from my point of view, doing interviews with other people, here's a guy who interviewed tons of folks related to Sousa. He didn't interview Sousa himself, but he did interview a lot of the band members that played his music, a lot of folks that uh, worked in the music publishing to um, arrange his music, typeset his music. He even talked to John Philip Sousa's cook, which I thought was really great because uh, you think, okay, wow, he's really going for the details. <laughs> um, but really what he found was that the cook actually had a diary of all the places that they played for the period of time that he was working because he had a listing of all the grocery stores and farmers markets to go and get fresh fruit and food for the for the band. Um, and that helped Paul document where exactly the band was playing. So it was very interesting uh, research and a very interesting guy. So let's uh, let's hear a little segment of Paul talking about the Stars and Stripes forever. I'll tell you, I've, the one statement that I have made many times is that I personally believe this man expressed his love of country and his patriotism in a more profound way than any other composer who ever lived in any era of any country. I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. And I I have yet to find a musicologist that convinced me otherwise. If you just look at the titles of his music alone, there he, you, you see that he is telling the story of his beloved country. I mean, a man was... When asked his occupation, he would say, I'm a salesman of Americanism. He was very sensitive that that America had a bad rap as being inferior to Europeans when it comes to music. He tried to change that, and I think he did. So he preached Americanism through his music all around the world. And like I say, if you just look at the titles of his music, it tells the story. And he lived his patriotism, loving country in his everyday life. I mean, for example, he spent a total of 19 years in military service. I mean, he was director of the Marine Band in Washington for 12 years. He had his own professional band for 39 years. And during World War I, he was in charge of the Navy training bands at the Naval Training Station in Chicago. So he preached Americanism wherever he went. And with his band, which was without equal in those days, well, he made a pretty good statement for America. Once again, that was Paul Byerly. And next up, we're going to hear from Jimmy Sade again, uh, talking about Sousa being a patriot, um, defining the generation of music and his impact with the Stars and Stripes forever. He was really the greatest patriot in this country at that time. And what you are asking about is is why was why were people so engrossed with John Philip Sousa? Well, in the first place, I've already explained that uh, these traveling concert bands was the music of that era. And then when you say that, and then you say John Philip Sousa was one of them, but he wasn't here. He was the one up here. And so here he's writing these marches, but there was one march that he wrote that has turned out to be in, in, the, in the last, uh, uh, really the last uh, 75 years or so, as the most patriotic march at, in the world, and the reason why I say the, in the world, because when the Stars and Stripes Forever is played in China, or and I'm just naming some countries, and they recognize it right off, they think that is our national anthem. Mm -hmm. 
A lot of them do. And so closely associated with America. And they, they associate that with America. In fact, it is uh, the, the tune actually is a, a better kind of sound for patriotism than the Star Spangled Banner because we don't sing Star Spangled Banner too well. You know that? And of course, there are no words basically to the uh, Stars and Stripes Forever except pe- the words that people have made up. There are words. He wrote words. Uh, but uh, they are not part of the official. Now, you know the Stars and Stripes Forever is the National March of the United States. You know that. You. Yes, me and uh, uh, I was called to Congress along with John Philip Sousa III, his uh, grandson, to testify. Well, John Philip Sousa III, who was a good friend, uh, I called him JP3, and you can understand that. Well, JP3 didn't say much, on it, and he told him why. He said, I don't want people to think that I'm promoting my grandfather for any uh, reasons of money or anything like that. So he spoke a little bit. He told me before we went, he says, you do most of the speak. Well, I did. And uh, so we did that. And later on, in uh, 1987, December the 6th, Dr. Uh, doctor, President, I don't think he'd want me to call him a doctor, but President Ronald Reagan signed the bill to make the Stars and Stripes Forever the National March of the United States. And the newspapers and media really played it up big, you know, for a little while. Pretty big thing. We so, didn't have a national march. Did never we? had a national march. And, in fact, it had been proposed to Congress 11 times since 1915 and each time turned down. For what reason? No well, I know, well uh, I know this, that I learned from Paul Barley again, that uh, uh, one of the basic reasons was that the congressman, Senate, Congress, thought that uh, that, might, that might be taking away from our national anthem, mm. which, of course, it wasn't anything like that at all. So when we got to working on it, promoting it, and we had big celebrations and all sorts of things putting this thing together and it it passed and one of the reasons it really passed Senator David Bourne from Oklahoma at that time who happened to be a friend his family was a friend of our family and he's now the president of Oklahoma University but he was a saxophone player in high school and also at Yale University and when I approached him about it he said you know good and well that I will help with that. And, and with his promotion, why he found a congressman, one of the congressmen he could depend on, that would try to put it through the House. And of course, he put it through the Senate without a dissenting vote at all in the Senate. And I don't know what they actually did in the House, but anyway, it all passed. That's beautiful. Yeah, that was the... Did Ziggy Coyle have anything to do with it? Ziggy Coyle, Ziggy, my dear friend, when he heard that I was promoting this, and I, and I also was promoting uh, a concert, a John Philip Sousa concert played by bands all around the country, I just had this in mind. Ziggy heard about it, and he came to me and he says, Jim, I want to help you. I want to tell you, that guy, he's a past, it was a past president of, of NAM, by the way, mm-hmm. Ziggy Coyle worked his tail off. I mean, we worked together, but he was he was the promoter in this way. See, I had promoted getting the uh, uh, around the country to have bands, even high school bands, play Sousa type concerts. Well, at those concerts, he's the one that promoted it by in this respect, having I want to say um, petitions having people sign petitions to make the Stars and Stripes Forever the National March of the United States. And, and uh, Ziggy came with me when I testified at Congress. On that day, he had them sent to uh, Senator Boren. 
On that day, there were over 250,000 petitions or signatures sent to Senator Bourne uh, on the day that we testified. In fact, we've got a picture of Senator Bourne and, uh, and uh, JP3 and uh, myself and Z and, uh, and the congressman. Uh, on, Is that the one at the steps of... Uh, yeah, on the steps. That was the day. In fact, it doesn't show the, uh, the 250,000 petitions. They're right by the side of, uh, of Senator Bourne. You don't see it in the picture, but they're right there. Yeah. How big a stack is that? It was, as I remember, there were boxes about like this and about that high and probably, <laughs> I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 big boxes like that. Wow. I don't really remember how many, but that was something. So that rounds out our segment uh, about that particular march, probably one of the most iconic pieces of American music maybe ever written. I would say so. Yeah. Um we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. We're going to kind of move away from particular marches, and we're going to get into an aspect that we love here at NAM, and that is the instruments themselves, the actual products. And so we're going to hear in this uh, topic, we're going to hear from Paul and Jimmy again, but we're going to have a new voice. Anybody want to introduce our new voice? Our new voice is going to be Steve Dillon who we got to interview at the NAMM show in 2017. So uh, it's really kind of fun to have a, a, a new expert and uh, weigh in on uh, his his thoughts about the sousaphone. But first, we're going to shift it back to Paul, who's going to be talking about the sousaphone upright. Well, looking at the sousaphone we have today, it, it has the bell forward. And, the, and it was produced first by C.G. Kahn. It has a bell forward. But the one that Sousa used in his band and it was designed at his suggestion was the bell up, the one they called the rain catcher. Now he had asked Harry Coleman if he would take the old helicon, which you know, goes around your body like a sousaphone and it shoots off to the southwest. If he would take that and make the bell so that it shot right straight up in the air. So Harry Coleman built the first upright sousaphone. This was about 1893. And I do have a picture of that in one of my books the original sousaphone that was found over in Philadelphia. And uh, J.W. Pepper restored the thing, and so I was able to get some good quality pictures of it and a little bit of the story. But thereafter, Kahn took over, and they produced it in much many larger quantity. Mm. And then they, later they pointed the bell forward which is the sousaphone that we know today. But his reason for wanting the bell upright was that it would not be directional. As he says, he wants the sound to mushroom over the band like a frosting on a cake. So if you look at the picture of Sousa's band through the years, he would mix these upright sousaphones with regular tubas. Then in the 20s, he used the sousaphone, the upright sousaphone, exclusively. And he did not like the forward bell. He didn't use those. That's very interesting. Now, did he have a... I, I heard that he had a uh, friendship with uh, Colonel Kahn, C.G. Kahn. Yeah. They knew each other. Oh, yes, of course. And along that same line, there were a number of the instrumentalists of the band that endorsed the Khan instruments. And uh, Sousa personally preferred to have the instruments, the families of instruments made by one manufacturer. He thought it would give a more blended sound that way. So if you look, it's pictures by 
here's a whole cornet trumpet section playing con cornets and trumpets. That isn't to say that he didn't use other types. I know Frank Simon, for instance, used a Holton for a while when he was playing with Sousa. And, and Frank told me that Sousa approved of it. He would prefer he play con, but he was getting such a good sound out of his Holton. He said, just keep playing it. Hmm. But as far as I've been able to determine, Sousa did not get a stipend from Kahn for the use of his instruments. Now, the only kickback there was that the players were often presented the instruments in exchange for their endorsement. But I don't think Sousa was paid for that endorsement. But on some of the old programs, you'll see Sousa's band endorses Kahn instruments. Well, he did, but that didn't mean that he was paid for that endorsement. But the players would get their free instruments. That's about the size of it. Very interesting. Now, um, one of the cornet players, there's a side story about Clark and his uh, disdain of trumpets versus the cornets. Will oh, you yeah. please tell me that? Yeah, he... Uh, he thought that trumpets would fall by the wayside. It didn't work out that way, but he preferred the sound of the cornet because it's, it has a a more mellow tone, a richer tone, you might say. Maybe mellow isn't the right word, but that's what he preferred to play. And he was of the opinion that they should be used in orchestras instead of trumpets too. But that never came to pass. That was awesome. I, I really enjoy listening to Paul. He's an amazing guy. Uh, did a lot of research on John Philip Sousa and we're all the benefit of that. He documented an awful lot of great uh, information. I failed to say earlier that another book that Paul put together was manuscripts and photographs uh, from John Philip Sousa's personal collection that was not going to be, at least in the foreseeable future, published. And Paul worked really long and hard with the family to get that out there. And that was very insightful for um, for researchers and band directors to get a better insight as to the temperament of the music that Sousa gave us. And so coming up, um, we're going to talk to uh, Jimmy Sade again uh, and hear another segment about the sousaphone, which is kind of very interesting uh, history in the music products industry. This is a very interesting instrument. Of course, we all see them in the half times at the football games. It's the big tuba with the big bell and you can wear it. And, and that wearing ability, putting it around your shoulder is the difference between a tuba and a sousaphone. And uh, John Philip Sousa was playing an awful lot of band concerts in the parks and they found that while they were marching to get to the park the bell needed to be um, facing the audience or the the people right in front of them but when they got to the concert it was way too loud to be facing in that direction so he wanted the bell to be manipulative so that it could be pointing up and at that point people started calling that the rain catcher because the bell was facing straight up to the sky but it served a purpose if you could rotate that so that first concept was given by john philip Sousa to the jw pepper folks which is still a music publishing company in pennsylvania they first made the sousaphone but it was mass produced later by the cg con company in elkhart indiana and so the story goes that that was probably um, one of John Philip Sousa's favorite accomplishments is that he provided the inspiration for a, a musical instrument. So let's hear from Jimmy Sade about that. Do you know the story about the connection between John Philip Sousa and Colonel Kahn? Yes. To this point, they were very good friends. The sousaphone itself, which was his design, actually was not made by Con the first one. Uh, it was Pepper, wasn't it? A pepper, right. And then shortly after that, uh, he changed it a tiny bit and had Con, Mr. Con, uh, Colonel Con, they call it, uh, 
they were friends, and he had him make the sousaphone. The sousaphone, you know, was known by everybody. Uh, a lot of people don't know just what they... It's that big instrument played in the band, in the marching band. And so. Now, I was under the impression, and I haven't been able to pinpoint this, maybe you can speak of it, the helicon mm -hmm. that has a rotating bell is basically the sousaphone. Is he, that correct? He used, before he did the sousaphone, he used a, a, the helicon. Sometimes the helicon... It comes down about like this. I have one in, in, in my store. I have a helicon. And uh, uh, it was before, it's, it's a tuba, like the sousaphone is a tuba. And uh, then he played later some upright tubas, just like we have today. Of course, not, not as good as these today, but upright tubas. And then he did the sousaphone, which is like we see quite often on parades and of course, they use them in concerts, too. Mm. The sousaphone is still there. I presume it always will be. We just got done hearing from Jimmy there about his relationship with uh, between Sousa and Colonel Khan and how the sousaphone and Helicon, did I say that right? Yes. Helicon came to be. And we're going to hear from that new voice now. We're going to hear from St Steve Dillon, who Dan mentioned we interviewed at the NAM show back in 2017. And he is the owner of Dylan's Music in New Jersey. And his story is pretty interesting. He got his uh, start kind of dealing in antique instruments and then found a love for it and just grew. And he's got some great stories about uh, just filling up his apartment with instruments <laughs> from floor to ceiling. And I could just, as he was telling it, I could just picture it and how maddening that must have been for anyone who lived with him. Um <laughs> But in this segment, Steve is going to be talking about Sousa using a sarusaphone. Sarusaphone. Mm -hmm. Sarusaphone. Say it, say it like you mean it. Sarusaphone. Sarusaphone. Oh, yeah. Well, that was angry. That was a little angry. Sarusaphone. <laughs> <laughs> Which I always just picture Dr. Seuss when you get into all these instruments, <laughs> and then he named them. Um, so we're going to hear from Steve Dillon talking about Sousa using a sarusaphone in this segment. Contrabass sarusaphone. They made a whole family. I have one at the shop. Do you? A gold-plated con. <laughs> Contrabass sarusaphone. Yeah, and it's got the... And it's funny because they, they basically play with a double reed, but this one has the little mouthpiece that you can put on and play it with a single reed. But they made a... Over the years, I've had tenor sarusaphones, soprano sarusaphones. Uh, I don't get them as much anymore. It, that's a very limited market. But, you know, as with anything, there's you, you'll find a person... That wants it. Mm. There's a lid to every pot. <laughs> <laughs> I find it fascinating. There was a short period of time, maybe two or three years, where the sarusaphone was uh, heard in many jazz recordings. Yep. Yep. As a matter of fact, even the, the band of John Philip Sousa around the turn of the last century, the 1900s, uh, he used the sarusaphone for a short period of time in his band. Mm. Not a large, but they're akin to, they're akin to the contrapassoon. So that was Steve Dillon, and that's going to round out our segment on instruments in their relation to Sousa and kind of the March era. And we're going to shift our focus once again to the popularity of Sousa and his music. And we're going to start this section off by hearing from Paul Byerly again, talking about uh, Sousa being the biggest name in music. At one time, believe it or not, the man was the most popular name in music. As John Sousa III used to say, he was a sort of the Elvis Presley of his day. I mean, it was Sousa on the records, Sousa on the concert halls, Sousa at band concerts all around the world. Didn't he was incre even, incredibly popular. Mm, didn't they even have like memorabilia, spoons and cups and all kinds of stuff, right? Oh, yeah, little things like that. And, of course, his sheet music was printed in several countries, some of it not legally. But just an example of his popularity, his march, the Washington Post, was written as a march, but it fit the rhythm of the two-step dance, and it was danced to all around the world. You imagine that? Here's a march that's being danced to as a two-step. And in Europe at the time, 
they didn't call it the two-step. They called it all two steps, Washington Posts. So that is an example of his popularity. And everywhere he went, his music was being played. And, and I remember his solo cornetist, Frank Simon, telling me that when he grew up as a boy in Middletown, Ohio, he said he could not walk down one city block in Middletown, Ohio, but what he didn't hear, a Susan March being played on a piano in one of the houses. So his name was on the sheet music, it was on the recordings, and, and bands were playing his music all the time. He was incredibly popular. And he was also the highest paid musician in the world. Mm. He made a fortune off his sheet music alone, not his recordings, because he didn't conduct the recordings, but he had agreement with Victor Talking Machine Company, and, and he permitted his bandsmen to uh, you make the recordings, although he didn't conduct. Boy, he didn't get an awful lot of money from the recordings, but he did make his money off the sheet music and, of course, the concerts. When, when Sousa's band came to town, it was literally a big deal when they had an afternoon concert for you know, a matinee, when a lot of times where the businesses in town were shut down so people could go here, this man called the March King who came to town. So his name was familiar to just about everyone. As the, as the, com as the saying goes, his name was a household word. What's really cool about Sousa and his popularity is that uh, here at the Museum of Making Music, which is located uh, almost directly below us as we speak, there is a really cool exhibit that kind of focuses on the heart of Sousa and the marching band. Right, Dan? That's right. And it's really interesting because at that era, which is the uh, 1880s, 1890s, there was something like 10,000 different ceremonial bands in this country and ceremonial bands for those of you who grew up in a small town or remember visiting grandma and her small town with a, uh, a gazebo in the main square almost always there would be a community band that would play there on Sundays or Saturday afternoons and the music that they played during this era right after the Civil War were marches and popular music and John Philip Sousa's uh, songs were certainly among those so he was very instrumental in all of that, as well as the growth and development of the band movement, as we now call it. So we often talk about Elkhart, Indiana as the band capital of the world. Certainly it was the band capital of the United States and remains to be that way. There's still uh, several companies uh, that are making products in Elkhart including Selmer and Kahn, which are now one company, and um, mouthpiece maker J.J. Babbitt and several others. And what's interesting is during that era, there was such a demand because of those 10,000 bands that I mentioned earlier that these instruments were being mass produced for the first time in the United States. So people like uh, C.G. Kahn got together and said, let's expand our plant. They moved to Elkhart and did just that. And as a result, we're able to offer more than just the regular instruments, uh, not just the most popular trumpet and trombones, saxophones, but sousaphones and others that were particular to marching music. So all that to say that that movement was really exciting and uh, John Philip Sousa's contributions can't go unnoticed as far as the popularity of that movement. And interestingly enough, he had a strong friendship with uh, Colonel Kahn, who, when he purchased, when Colonel Kahn purchased the Washington Post newspaper, John Philip Sousa wrote the march, the Washington Post march, in celebration of that purchase, which I think is very interesting. Colonel Kahn also owned the Elkhart Truth, which is the name of the, uh, the newspaper in Elkhart, Indiana, originally called the Music Truth or musical truth, as it was in the 1930s. So um, his contributions to that area uh, obviously continued to be an influence. So with all that said, where are we going next? Next, we're going to hear from Jimmy Sade again, 
and he is going to be talking about a lot of things, um, starting off with uh, the state of communities when Sousa came to town, and then Sousa being the number one March composer, and wrapping things up with uh, Sousa um, being a household name and the products with his name on them. When Sousa came to town, the businesses, in fact, most, most activities of any kind would cease. Businesses would declare a holiday. And uh, schools closed, of course. American flags were flown throughout the town. And people came from miles around to see the March King, as he was known for the many marches that he wrote. And they came naturally on horses and wagons. Remember, you've got to keep in mind when I'm saying this, that there was, as I mentioned, no radio, television, or any of that stuff. So when he came to town, it was a big thing. His only competition, and that was small in comparison, was the Barnum and Bailey Circus. That pretty much happened the same with them. Schools would be let out. Everybody went to circus. And this wasn't just a little old town in Kansas or Missouri or Oklahoma, but in Chicago or any big city, same thing. For instance, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And in Tulsa, Oklahoma, he, he was here uh, eight times in this city. Wow. Yeah. And this, and this was not even a state when he first came here. No, this was this was Oklahoma Territory. It was not even a state. And uh, so you can tell, I, I have got all the, the places where he was, exactly what he played, and the programs of exactly what he played, every march, every number, which I got, of course, entirely from Paul Byerly. Does it surprise you that John Philip Sousa is still the March King? I mean, a hundred years later, and he is still the number one March composer. Does that surprise you? Not at all, for this reason. <clears throat> the March, uh, in the early part of the century, was played much more than it is now. Now, that may sound awful, but, you know, we have a different kind of music. Now, all kinds of uh, different kinds of music. Just uh, in those days, just like I mentioned at the early bit of this talk, the kind of music then was basically band music, concert band music. And I told you the reasons why. So the march is not played as much as it should be. It is for high school and college university bands and, and, and that sort of thing. In, in those days, you still got to think early 20th century. Uh, in the first, actually, 10 years or so. Uh, do you know uh, the name Sousa was a household word? Mm-hmm. It actually, they, they had all kinds of little uh, uh, things made with Sousa's name on them being sold in the stores and with John Philip Sousa, or mainly just. Sousa, although that name is a lot of it in the in the East, but th- what that means is that man. Mm. For example, what what sort of products? Are you oh, I happen to have uh, I happen to have a, one of these little spoons, a, real, a silver, a real nice spoon, where his picture is engraved in the inside. And of course, in those days, it wouldn't have cost as much today. That would cost quite a bit to do. It's engraved. Yes, wow. uh, inside. But, you know, probably in those days that could have been done pretty cheap. But uh, things like that, I don't know about whether they had, they didn't have fountain pens anyway, but pencils or whatever they had, that had his name on them. Uh, of course, there were some, they had some band instruments, con band instruments. They would say played by John Philip Sousa. They would be con band instruments played by John Philip Sousa. There was one piano, and I've forgotten which one it actually is, that was, whatever the name was, played by John Philip Sousa. But there were things that just had the name Sousa. It was, it was a household word. 
I'm sure there are a lot of balloons and that sort of thing, you know. So that was Jimmy kind of going over a whole wealth of information about Sousa there. You can really tell that he knows his stuff, man. Not only knows his stuff, but it's so exciting to listen to him because when he says, wow, when John Philip Sousa comes to (laughs) town, schools would close and flags would wave. And I mean, you just want to stand up and start screaming the stars and stripes forever or something. He's an amazing, passionate guy, as you can tell. It's contagious. It is contagious. (laughs) Uh, So we're going to move our focus again and this time we're going to be talking more specifically about bands playing Sousa and that experience so luckily we get to hear from Jimmy again so if you aren't fired up yet waving your American (laughs) flag still uh, you might be soon so this first clip Jimmy's going to be talking about Sousa being unique and uh, how there was this niche kind of need for Sousa to kind of slip right in there because at the time there was no real music making opportunities for people or a chance for people to hear music in their homes and uh, how that kind of spurred the appearance of community bands. Well, you know, Dan, <clears throat> uh, you said something about his being uh, very unique. Uh, I've, I've already forgotten your exact word, but uh, he was a very unique man in music history in this country. And a lot of people, of course, don't know this because uh, time has passed. And uh, uh, let me tell you just what what the story is about Sousa. Do you know that in the early part of the 20th century, probably your great-grandfather, maybe even in in your case since you were so young, it might have been your great-great-grandfather and grandmother. You know what, what they did for music? No, you don't know what they did for music because there was no radio, no television, no no automobiles, no airplanes, no movies. And uh, so what did these people, especially out in the boondocks, what did, what did they do for music? They made their own music at, in, in the home with the piano and the violins and uh, zithers and mandolins and, and some guitars and, and, uh, and maybe a few band instruments here and there. But nothing, that was their music. So in that, in that part of the time, in the early part of the uh, uh, early, well, actually in the latter part of the 19th century was when it really began, in the last 10 years or so, there were concert bands that traveled across the country, some of them small, some of them uh, fairly large, when I say like 50 pieces or something like that. They travel across the country naturally on trains. No buses, no, naturally, is no uh, planes or uh, buses of any kind. And uh, they would go around to the different towns and play a concert. And naturally, we were talking about Sousa, so who would you expect to be the one who was greater than all of the rest put together. John Philip Sousa. And why was he? Well, one of the reasons, because this guy had a, a, a great brain, and he, he knew how to put things together. So, he had the finest musicians. Now, get this, Dan. He had the finest wind musicians. Not in Oklahoma, not in uh, the South, not in the United States, but in the whole world. And they were paid more than any musicians around the world. Why? Because they traveled the the United States and Europe quite a bit and made two world tours. So they were paid more than any other musician. In those days, a professional-type musician didn't have enough work. They did with the John Philip Sousa band. Awesome. It's always great to hear from uh, Jimmy Say. That was a beautiful segment. And I want to take a second to thank Elizabeth for putting this podcast together. She did all the research and time codes and put all these in these categories. And I think it's really a very fun experience. So thank you for that. There's my compliment. There we go. <laughs> it took me a while. But there one, one, Mike. <laughs> Game on. on. So next we're going to hear from a very interesting guy named Harold Gore. Uh, Harold was born in 1930, uh, passed away in 2013. We got to interview him in 2006, and he ran a uh, 
a music publishing company called Pender's Music, which is still being run by his son Richard today. And a very interesting guy also, like these others that we've heard earlier, very passionate about John Philip Sousa. In fact, Harold made it his life's work to make sure that every piece of John Philip Sousa's music was published. And that was not an easy task. I mean, hundreds of songs for one, but just getting the copyrights, finding the original manuscripts, then oftentimes having to have those uh, transcribed. It was a very daunting task. It took him decades, but he was very proud of the fact that in the end, he was able to publish all of Sousa's works. So it's a, it was a delight to interview him, have him part of the NAM Oral History Program. And thanks to Elizabeth. Oh, that's two. Oh, um, no. Who's the favorite now? <laughs> <laughs> we get to hear him talking a little bit about his hero, uh, John Philip Sousa. When I do a, a, one of the Sousa marches, I add a few percussion parts and a few changes. Uh, for Sousa never wrote but one percussion part. And if it's for cymbals, bass drum, snare drum, every once in a while, uh, triangle, Clavis, Tiffany, and all this. All that is all the, on this one sheet of paper. So I break it down into about four four different parts so that each part has their has their own has their own part there. So and I and I try to put the, when I do the barges, I try to spell it out that the the uh, the dynamics are all the same. It the the phrasing crescendos and decrescendos are all the same. And try to make them just more playable, more musical. Mm, that's neat. So, and I've had some success at it. Okay, Mike, since I like you so much, oh. I want you to introduce oh, Jimmy Sage. You just came out and said it. How about that? <laughs> I'm going to go cry in the corner. Can you turn my mic off? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's Jimmy Say It again, and uh, this time he's going to be talking about Sousa inspiring people to pick up instruments for their own community bands. What are your thoughts about his influence on all of these other ceremonial bands? You know, in this country, right at the time that he was so popular, in every small town that had a gazebo, we had a marching band. And a lot of these were not professional musicians. These were bakers and butchers, and during the week they would practice, and then on Sunday afternoon in this gazebo, they would play for their, their neighbors who would have a picnic lunch in the park and whatnot. John Philip Seuss is getting a, a lot of the credit for helping foster that. Do you, do you agree with that? Not only that, I think I mentioned right at the beginning of this little talk that I put it in different words. But you see, why we have uh, high school bands, junior high bands, middle school, college, and so on, why we have them today was through the influence of John Philip Sousa. The community bands like the one you're talking about, when he came to town way back there when there was no community band, right after he left and everybody's so happy, some of them picked up horns, you know, and it may be just seven or eight pieces, maybe 15 pieces. They had a band, the town band. That's what you were talking about. Where did they get it? Basically from John Philip Sousa and his tours. See, coming into the to the city, and they heard a band, and they heard a fine band, so they wanted. That's where that came from. I really like the way that uh, Elizabeth put this together because oh, now man. we have this. <laughs> this is getting it's ridiculous. Like pitting your parent against two siblings is how I feel like what was going on I right now. I feel like I have to even it out too. <laughs> uh, but you know, sort of, this is a teaser, even though you guys don't know it. But we're kind of building up to um, talking with a guy or playing his interview, um, John P. Smith, who actually got to meet Mr. Souza, which is awesome. I mean, we're kind of building up to, hey, we have actually somebody in our collection that met the man, and it's a very interesting story. In fact, this is my favorite, one of my favorite web clips on our website. Um, John P. lived really close to us here in Carlsbad, California. He was born in 1910, passed away in 2008. I got to interview him in 2003 here at the Museum of Making Music downstairs from the NAM building. Uh, John was a really interesting guy, very talented musician who actually went on uh, to play um, first chair saxophone for several big bands during the big band uh, uh, craze. 
in the 1930s and 40s, including uh, Artie Shaw, a very well-known band. But earlier in his life, uh, he got to meet John Philip Sousa, and uh, you will hear his emotion when he is talking about hearing Stars and Stripes uh, and the opportunity to just see Mr. Sousa. So uh, let's go ahead and play John P. Smith talking about meeting John Philip Sousa. Uh, and here it comes out on the platform, uh, this pompous, wonderful gentleman, John Philip Sousa. And I thought, my, would I like to meet this man. Uh, maybe I could ask him if I could join his band. Or something. And uh, so I got around to the uh, steps that went up where he was standing. And uh, I thought, uh, yeah, I will. I'm going, to, I'm going to go and meet him. And I started up the steps, and he had already turned and made kind of a military uh, on the wheel, on his heels turn to go in uh, the stage door. And uh, I thought, oh, i got to hurry, which I did. And he looked around and saw me, and I said, Mr. Sousa, Mr. Sousa, I said, I want to meet you. And... Uh, he looked around, uh, he had a uh, uh, look on his face like he was preoccupied with something. And I said, Mr. Sousa, I said, I play in the, in the house band here on trombone and, and I'd, I'd like to meet you and I'd like to, and, and I knew this wasn't uh, getting very deep in his ears because he still had this uh, look on his face like he was thinking about something. and. And he was cordial enough uh, to me, and uh, called me, said John, and, and uh, uh, then he left, and left me standing there. But I was all so thrilled with him that, uh, I mean, his greatness just uh, seemed to uh, emanate all, all, all through me that uh, here is a man that has uh, changed music so much, and even instruments, the sousaphone. Uh, and uh, what a deep thinker, uh, great visionary he was. He was just a wonderful, wonderful man. I uh, saw the show and was I impressed. And my gosh, you, you hear these things that uh, you played uh, all your young life. Uh, and um, I mean, then when he comes to this <laughs> Oh, I just fall apart. And then it comes back into the main theme, you see. And uh, of course his other marches uh, besides uh, we're all, all great too, but uh, he he was the uh, man who really was emulated throughout the music world. Just just a great. He he brought things that no one ever thought of, and hasn't haven't thought of since. I'm sure. And if you want to see any of the footage, the video footage to go along with any of these interviews or explore our collection any further, as Dan mentioned, we have uh, quite a hosting of web, what we call web clips on our site. And I think Mike would be amazing at directing you to that page. If you're interested in watching any of these videos, you can head over to www.nam.org slash library. I love it. How none, was that? Was that good? Of, yeah, and none of, just yeah, to let like you guys it. know, none of those tags are uh, pre-recorded, so <laughs> you get A plus work every time from us. That was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to round out this interview now and leave you with some final thoughts. I just thought this clip is very poignant, a great way to end the interview. So we're going <clears> to <throat> You mean turn, podcast? Oh yeah. Whoo. Got interviews on the brain. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said it twice, actually. <laughs> I was going to let it pass, and then I'm like, uh, okay, sorry. Sorry. So we're going to round out this 
podcast uh, by turning it back over to Steve Dillon. He's just got some really great remarks that are very poignant and kind of leave us on a good note talking about Sousa. And so here's Steve Dillon talking about Sousa understanding the essence of music that music is when you boil it down entertainment if you can't call it entertainment you're not doing it right in steve dylan's mind so we're going to hear that um how susa kind of was the forefather of ragtime uh heading to the paris exposition which i thought was the history nerd to me thought that was super cool and unfortunately the death of the susa band what's among the most fascinating things to you about john philip susa john philip susa okay well Sousa was understood things very... He understood the number one thing that musicians forget a lot of times. Music is entertainment. And if you don't entertain the public, you don't get paid. I teach this course at New Jersey City University on music business. And the first thing I ask the students, I say, what is the definition of music. And they go on to these, well, it's this, this. I said, no, it's entertainment. Once you forget it's entertainment, you don't get paid. John Philip Sousa understood that all his life, that the people who are coming to see him, he's not there to really educate them, though he did. He's there to entertain them. And I hearken back to a, 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 a newspaper critic Uh, talking about him in the 1890s, in the late 1890s. He came into, I think it was Rockford, Illinois, and uh, the critic starts the the piece out. He says, John Philip Sousa was able to do what Theodore Thomas with his great Chicago symphony was unable to do. He kept the people in their seats, and he kept them entertained. Now, if you looked at his program, and the critic even says this, Sousa would start with an overture. Now, that's a classical piece, and that was done for the highbrows. Then, then he would encore with two or three marches. That was done for the lowbrows. But guess what? At the end of the, the concert, everybody was entertained and everybody was happy. And then the lowbrows, as they call them, might have said, you know what, I'd like that. Piece. I'm going to go see if I can find you. Normally they did operatic overtures. So let's say they did an operatic overture to an opera that was coming. I'm going to go see that. So he did something. He ed- educated, but not forced it down their throats. I like to say, I'll go to a concert, and I'll eat my vegetables, but I want a little dessert after. The problem is, they want to shove vegetables down my throat the whole damn time. <laughs> But Sousa was, and Sousa really uh, brought to the American public, his band, uh, you know, brought to the American public good music. He really, by his band going across, well, not only good music, he, he was responsible for the spread of a lot and helping the symphony orchestras that were in their infancy coming up at that time, pushing people to go to them. But he also was responsible for the, the spread of ragtime and early jazz because his band would play them because he understood, listen, if I want to get people, I have to play the popular stuff of the day. So his band, and Arthur Pryor was the one who taught the Sousa band to play the syncopated music So uh, because he was a contemporary, Pryor was a contemporary of Scott Joplin's and lived in Missouri, grew up in Missouri, not far from Joplin. So he understood the genre. And so the Sousa band would play ragtime and go across the country. Matter of fact, it's funny. When I talk about Sousa band went over to uh, France in 1900. Uh, they represented the United States at the Paris Exposition. And one of the things they brought with them was ragtime. And the music critic there was Debussy. All right? Gollywog's Cakewalk, somewhat ragtime-ish. Was there any influence? I bet there was. <laughs> But he was, he was really, but he also understood this. When my time is up, we're done. Sousa's band, when John Philip Sousa died in 1932, his band was done. And that was also the end of the touring bands. It was the last of the era of the touring bands. They kept on a little bit more, but they weren't funded. He was not funded by uh, uh, government. He was funded by ticket sales. And when it was done, it was done. You know, genres of music at times just go by the wayside. It's like clothing. We're not wearing short breeches with stockings anymore because that went out of fashion. 
think time moves on. If he was here today and the band was here today, they'd be playing hip-hop and rap. They'd figure a way to put, uh, uh, program it because that was the genius of Sousa. And I think that's the reason we have problems with our major symphonies today. They're not attracting an audience that wants to come hear it. Again, please, play for me something I want to hear and I'll listen to something I don't want to hear. But they don't do that. Sousa understood how to do it, how to entertain. Thanks for joining us once again. We hope you had a safe and happy 4th of July. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.